how can we use deep learning to improve HPC? Uh, so I'm invited today to talk a little bit about introduction to accelerated computing, talk a little bit about the architectural, some of the interesting architectural things about GPUs. Uh, so without further ado, <coughs> a few uh, product slides to get through. So basically about in 2006, we announced CUDA as a way of taking graphical processing units and actually using them to do things other than graphics. So, uh, people have been around long enough, but before that you could actually do it as well by writing OpenGL shaders to re reprogram the GPUs to do cool things. Now, CUDA was launched as a programming language. <coughs> In 2008, we had our very first system on the top 500. That was the original Savani system in Japan uh, from Satoshi Sato. Ten years on from that, you know, we're now seeing GPU computing becoming a major trend. And there's a few reasons for that. One of those, of course, is that there's been an exponential demand for compute. Okay? So compute cycles going out more and more. We look at growing use of deep learning at Google. Uh, we see cloud services that we all use on our phones. And there's a huge amount of computing going in behind that. And of course, supercomputing as well is getting more and more bigger all the time. So there's all these drivers for demand for compute cycles. <coughs> and HPC needs just keep growing and growing and growing. So we want to do better and better science. Yeah. So the ESPC position paper said last year, future Earth system models are going to need over a thousand times the compute that they have today. Uh, this study here from the European Centre for Medium Weather, medium range weather Forecasting, they're predicting they need a 2000x performance to get to where they want to be. Uh, NASA in the US with their HPC system, they, they want over 30 exaflops in 11 years' time. Okay? We're nowhere near an exaflop today. So there's this growing and growing demand. Right? We've got more instruments, we've got better instruments, whether they be radio telescopes, or particle accelerators, or weather satellites. Right? They're all giving us more data at higher fidelity, more resolution. We want our models to be able to assimilate that data and use it. We want to run our models at finer resolutions. And I want to give you a really good example that hopefully you all understand. <clears throat> and that's climate change. Climate change is a really, really big deal, and most people don't understand what's going on. Certain American president. <laughs> <laughs> One of the problems with climate, climate change is we can't do climate forecasts. We do what are called climate projections. Okay. So we, we calculate the climate forcings, and by changing those, we can see what's going to happen in the future. <clears throat> and that allows us to model different scenarios. Okay. So basically, once we built our model, created our forcings, we then go back and we start our model off. So back in 1850, for example, is all the data we've collected over the last 150 years. When we run our model forward, hopefully it looks like where we are today. And then we can project, project forward from there. Okay. So here's a couple of examples here. This is from IPCC, the International Panel for Climate Change. And you can see here's a, here's a scenario where we mitigate the number of uh, pollutants in the atmosphere, and here's one where we don't. We do business as usual. The problem with these things is they have very wide error bars. Okay? There's a big range between what they do. Uh, this is degrees in here, degrees C, sorry for the Americans and the Americans. Um, we can see we're looking at somewhere between 2 to 5 degrees. That's a pretty broad range. Okay? We really like that range to be better. Okay? So how can we make our prediction better? The answer is by doing more accurate science. And it turns out that the number one thing that drives this variance is how much clouds are in the atmosphere. Yeah? Because the sun puts out a steady amount of energy. Okay? So 1,300 watts per square meter, roughly, at the equator. <coughs> and what affects how much of that energy reaches the planet is clouds, which are quite pollutants and, and so forth. But anyway, with this model here, which is a low resolution model, shows 30% reflectance. This is the same model under the high resolution, we have 28%. That difference of 2% actually is the difference between these two values. 
So an extra 2% clouds brings us down to plus 2 degrees. But with a whole more accurate thing, we can see, oh, we're up here, this is bad. Okay? So the accuracy of the model becomes really, really important. Now, it turns out to correctly model clouds, you have to build your models at what's called a convective permitting or cloud resolving scale. And in the real world, that means under 3 kilometers. Okay, so each mesh, cell in the mesh of the model needs to be 3 kilometers or smaller for the CFD calculations to actually uh, permit clouds to resolve themselves inside those cells. Above that resolution, you have to do it as a physical parameterization, which is uh, inaccurate at best. <coughs> so we look at this high resolution climate model. It's a 36 year simulation. Okay. If we run it at one kilometer on a 5,000 node supercomputer, this is a top 10 supercomputer, it's actually in, in Switzerland, at CSCE at Media Swiss. <coughs> uh, on 5,000 nodes, it would take 840 days to run this 36 year simulation. That's war clock days. You'd be sitting there for three years waiting for the answer. Oh, and it would cost $68 million in hardware and use 22 gigawatts of power to run this one model for that one simulation. Okay? That's where scientists would like to go. They really, really want to go there. Right? Because they can give us much more accurate <coughs> climate modeling. Hopefully you can see the problem though. This is not really feasible. We can't really wait three years to see whether our model is right or not. And we can't really afford the power. Model. Especially in Switzerland. So we want more science, we want better fidelity, we want more resolution, we want to add more data from our instruments. These things are all important. So what's happening in the HPC world is that the HPC architecture has changed. Right? Uh, I've been in HPC for over 30 years and the good old days you just wait for the next CPU to come and your science got twice as fast. It was great. You know? that, that, those days have gone. You know, we've gone to the limits of CPU scaling pretty much. And that means that uh, we need a new way of doing this compute. And that's really why GPU accelerated architectures have got interesting. Right? So yeah, back, in the, back in the 90s, and the 80s and 90s, you could get half of your performance just by waiting for the transistors to get smaller. Okay? So you get 32x boost from gigaflops to teraflops just by waiting for the technology to get better. Uh, and half of the information you bring in your code. Right. That ratio has changed, and it changes again and again. As we go from petascale to exascale computing, right, we're really only getting one and a half x from the transistors. So we have to do most of this by parallelism. So parallelism is the key. We need lots and lots and lots of threads that are doing lots and lots and lots of work. And that's really where GPUs start getting interesting. Right. As I said, single thread performance is kind of tapered off. Yeah, a little bit better, little, little improvements, not much. Okay. And it's projected that the difference between that and what the GPUs are doing is going to be about a thousand X in six years' time. The okay. reason for that is because we're not bound by the same limitations. Right? The, uh, our current GPU, the Volta uh, V100, has 21 billion transistors. Okay. The only reason it's not 22 billion is because that's the size of the reticule. It's the biggest size we can make. Okay? Um, without going to um, uh, uh, different lithography by method. We can use as many transistors as we can get, and we don't see any end to that in the near term. Okay? We have no dark silicon, we keep the whole thing powered on all the time, we can use one of those transistors. It's a very different model to a CPU. So I'm going to get to some of the details of that. So, as well as the hardware side, we're also making improvements in the software architecture. NVIDIA is something like 12,000 employees. About 3,000 of those work on building GPUs, hardware designers. We have about 4,000 people who just write software. And we don't sell any of the software, it's all free. Right? It's like candy. You give it away to the evil people to buy, to buy GPUs. <laughs> Can buy our GPUs. Um, That's the basic idea. But when you look at what we're doing, right, not just in the hardware, but also in the software improvements, you're getting better than 
uh, better than more source improvements. So this is measured performance of a, of a mixture of uh, HPC applications. So it just shows you where we're getting it for the last few years. There's one other really, really important component, and that is energy efficiency. Okay. Right. We can't afford to run uh, yeah, these machines when they, when they need two, three hundred megawatts of power. It's just not feasible. Right. We can't do it. So we need to have a reasonable number of gigaflops per watt. And for exascale, the goal used to be 50, it's now about 33 gigaflops per watt. And we're well on the way there. We, we, we believe we'll be there. Pretty shortly. Yeah. So we're talking a little bit about energy efficiency. One of the reasons that GPUs are very energy efficient is because all of the floating point logic is fixed point. It is fixed. Okay. We don't need to build um, functional units that deal with varying bit widths. Okay. Varying uh, varying width uh, architectures uh, by nature about 10x the number of picojoules per operation. Whereas fixed logic that only does one thing uh, is much more energy efficient. It's just the way it is. <coughs> of course, we were very proud to work with uh, IBM uh, on building the world's fastest supercomputer. Uh, and I'm sure you've probably heard lots about it today, I'm just guessing. Uh, uh, it's the very first system to scale 100 petaflops. The interesting thing is it's not only the biggest HPC system in the world, it's just the biggest AI system in the world as well. So it clocks in something like three exaflops of deep learning performance. There are 27,000 GPUs in that machine. But for us at NVIDIA, it's not just about being the world's fastest machine, we're also in the world's second fastest, it's an error of course. Kind of like the little sister doesn't get as much attention. Somebody. Um, but also Europeans fastest uh, is data. Japan's fastest is ABCI. And the fastest non-government computer is the fastest classified non-government computer in the world, which is in Italy at ENI, which is an oil and gas company. They're using that for seismic interpolation, interpolation and reservoir modeling. So we're seeing a broad acceptance of GPUs as being part of the equation. We also saw the last year at the Supercomputing Conference in uh, Dallas, Texas. Um, the Gordon Bell Prize is kind of like the Nobel Prize for HPC guys. And five of the six nominations were all based on GPU accelerated computing. So I'm trying to build a case here for GPU accelerated computing. The, the why, if you like, and then we'll talk about the how. Okay. So we're seeing that if you want to accelerate computers, GPUs are the way to go. Uh, we've seen uh, large numbers of applications accelerated. All the top 15 largest uh, HPC applications are all accelerated. Uh, lots of new highs in the top 500. A quarter of the systems now on the top 500 are GPU accelerated. And of course, HPC itself is changing. This is what my area of research is about. It's not just about simulating stuff anymore. It's about how can we simulate stuff, but we can also add in things like machine learning or deep learning, okay, or broadly AI, uh, to assist that HPC market to grow. And that's a lot of what my lab does, is research into how we can do this. Okay, so I hope I've made the case for why GPUs are interesting. Okay. So, Really, where we want to go is somewhere we can't go today with CPUs alone. So you can have to have some sort of accelerator. We'd like you to use a GPU. Okay. The basic idea with GPUs, uh, I keep reading what's in the hand, uh, is we add GPUs to accelerate our applications. So they're like a co-processor. Okay. So the basic idea is that we try and move compute intensive functions onto the GPU. We keep the sequential code on the CPU. CPUs are much better at running the sequential code. Their, their clocks are a lot faster, more about three times as fast as the clocks on the GPU. GPUs have a lot of cores. That's what they do. Okay. So compute intensive codes that can be parallelized fit really well on GPUs. Okay. 
not so good for sequential code. Okay, so if you've got a lot of sequential code, better to keep it on the CPU. And it's this combination of the two that's really what's important. It's adding these two together. That's what GPU acceleration is all about. Let's talk a little bit about architecture. So this is a die shop for a Skylake CPU. It happens to be an 8-core one, but it doesn't really matter. It's just the, the, the point is. This is typically what you'd see uh, if you looked at a, a typical CPU. Uh, so this one has eight cores, eight CPU cores here. This is interfaces on the side and some other bits and pieces. Uh, here, last little cache in the middle. We break it out of it. This is what a single core looks like. Okay, uh, various bits and pieces. And this little bit down here is that actually does some work. Okay, so when your code actually wants to do something, here is where the execution units are. So these are the bits of the chip that actually run your code and, and do things for you. All the rest of this stuff here is trying to keep this thing busy. So you do things like out of order execution, rescheduling stuff, reordering buffers, all kinds of tricks and you know, using caches and stuff to hide latency so that you can keep these things as busy as possible. <coughs> so it turns out that on a typical CPU, right, only 10 to 12% approximately of the die is actually doing any useful work. Okay, the rest of it is basically about keeping it fed. Okay. So that's typically how CPU is done. I'm picking on Intel here, but that's okay, so it might be a good event. Let's look at a GPU. Okay, I'm not actually allowed to show you a die shop. Um, but it's actually not that different to this. It's squarer. Um, but uh, <coughs> it's more or less laid out this way on the chip. So this is uh, the GV100, uh, latest, latest uh, 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 enterprise GPU. Um, and it has 21 billion transistors on an 850 millimeter square uh, die. That's made with 12 nanometer FinFET uh, technology. Um, and the way this is built up is you have these sort of six large areas. Each one of these is effectively a GPU by itself. They just happen to really have just replicate them on the, on the thing itself. Yeah. So this yeah, area marked in red here. Uh, those, we call them GPCs, GPU processing clusters. Okay. And we just try, generally when we're scheduling stuff, we try and schedule the same threads within the same GPC. But that's not something you need to worry about. Okay. And then those are broken down eventually into these little things here called streaming multiprocessors. And these are effectively there. The, the guts of the machine. Okay. So there are 80 streaming model processors. There's actually 84 on the whole chip, but for yield purposes, we only enable 80. It means if one or two fail during testing, we can just mask them off and we can still use the chip. So it gets you the yields higher. Obviously, when you're building a chip like this, we're at the limits of what can be built. Uh, you don't get a lot of them on a wafer. <coughs> So you need to make sure you get as many as possible from the yield. <coughs> so that's where most of the good stuff goes. We do have a level two cache in the middle. Uh, we have high bandwidth memory interfaces on the sides, PCI Express at the top, and NVLink at the bottom. You see these six green bars at the bottom here. Uh, if you actually look at a streaming multiprocessor, there's 80 of these on the chip. What you'll see is that rather than having one floating point unit, right, we have an FP64 unit and we have an FP32 unit. So in other words, we build fixed logic for fixed widths. So um, there are 64 of these uh, FP32 units, okay, and then there are 32 of the FP64 units. So they're kind of balanced. Uh, we have a bunch of integer units again as well. Again, those just two integers. Right, so the logic is fixed, so you have to worry about it doing any floating point with those. So, uh, much more efficient in terms of power, which means we can put lots and lots of them on the chip. So we have over 5,000 cores. Uh, we also have these uh, tensor cores. This is one core, so it's about that big. You see they're much, much bigger than these guys. And there's only two of them in each of these blocks. So a total of eight in this, this stream of water processor. Those actually do a um, 
16 bit matrix metric multiply in one clock. So that's why they're so big. They're really complicated cores. Um, but those are specifically for the deep learning guys, uh, where they can run at a lower precision. <coughs> there are people looking at using them in the HPC space. We do have a couple of case studies where people have done mixed precision HPC. So they've done some of the calculations in FP64 and some in FP32 or even down to FP16. So if you can get down to FP16, you can actually use these tensor cores as well. Um, they were a very last minute addition to the chip. Uh, one of the good things about our process is we can actually make late minute changes to uh, our masks. And so these were thrown in more or less at the last, last moment before we actually manufactured the final masks for the Volta. Uh, that was because when we were doing Volta design a few years ago, it was apparent to us that AI was going to become a big thing. So we'd better get some hardware there. That, that's kind of where it came from. Now we're looking at, OK, can we use them on the HPC side as well? Since they're on the chip and they take up a huge chunk of space. But the important thing is the number of cores on the chip itself, typically when you're seeing something like 60% of the area is actually doing computing for you. Okay, so very different to a CPU where it might be 10% of the chip is actually doing the compute. So much more efficient, much more, uh, much better use of power. Uh, so, you know, we get 5,000 cores on a chip. Okay, now, obviously to exploit that, you need to have something that, that, that has that sort of level of parallelism. So I just wanted to show you a couple of practical architectures. Uh, this is the architecture of the summit. Okay, I'm, I'm sure you've seen the summit today. Um, so there's a picture there. <coughs> so as I said, each of these chips has six NVLink connections on the bottom. Okay? And vendors are free to do what they like with those. So you can couple them together. Okay, each one runs at 50 gigabytes per second. So you can couple two of them together to give you 100. Or three of them give you 150, or do what you like. Um, so the way that Summit went, okay, is they had the two power nine CPUs and six GPUs. Okay, so three GPUs connected to one CPU, three GPUs connected to another CPU. And so that gives you the six connections into the power nine, and all the GPUs are connected to each other. Okay, basically, it's a, it's a triangle, it's a squasher. Okay, so that's the way the sum is designed. Uh, Sierra, it's a little sister, um, is a different design. So in this case, they went with two GPUs for each CPU. So I know there's two CPUs and four GPUs. Because they've only got the two GPUs, they can now use three links. So they get better bandwidth between the CPU and the GPU. Uh, and GPU to GPU as well. So you trade off bandwidth versus number of GPUs in the node. So you can always make these design decisions. <coughs> okay. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about a couple of applications. Um, so the first one I want to talk about is Graph. <coughs> so Graph was something that IBM announced in February or January at CES. And I believe it's going to go live sometime in June. And what Graph is, is a global high resolution atmospheric forecasting system. <coughs> so typically the state of the art, the best you can get today is somewhere around 13 kilometer resolution. And for a lot of places it's 50, uh, and a few years ago it was 100. Okay. So, uh, this is an example here of a monsoon over India, showing at the, at the best the best science you could get. <coughs> uh, and here we can see the same data done with Graph. Okay. So Graph is running uh, normally at a three kilometer resolution. They actually use uh, a new piece of software called Enpass, and Enpass has the ability to have uh, it's, a, it's a finite volume code, so it can have an unstructured mesh which means you can have regions of refinement inside the mesh. So uh, over the boring parts of the ocean, they, they run at a lower resolution, and then over the land, they run at a 
a higher resolution. So they can, they're effectively mixing resolutions as they go. Um, but you can see that the, obviously the data is, is much higher fidelity, it's much more accurate. Yeah. Uh, rather than this kind of blobby data that we get here. <coughs> so this runs on 84 power line nodes. Uh, and each of those has four volts of V100 GPUs in it. And you can see that the mesh has these larger areas over water and then finer areas over land. But that's kind of the idea uh, with the MPAS. Okay. And I um, highly recommend you have a look at this. Uh, it was actually uh, posted, there was a uh, conference at Stanford uh, a few weeks ago. But uh, this guy from LNNL was talking about Sierra, some of the early science that's been done on Sierra. Um, in particular, uh, we, generally we can't talk about Sierra very much because it's so, uh, mostly does you know, nuclear weapon stuff. And they don't like people talking about that very much. Um, but they do do other stuff as well. Um, and so this is an interesting thing where they're looking at uh, earthquake simulations. So using a piece of software called SW4Raja, which is a GPU accelerated version, um, and comparing that to uh, Cori. So what they're showing here is modeling a magnitude 7 earthquake uh, on the Hayward Fault. So if any of you have been to the San Francisco Bay Area, you know the Hayward's bridges uh, on the way down to uh, sort of San Francisco. So what they want to do is model, model a, a magnitude 7 quake on there. So this is the computational domain that they're using for that. That's 120 kilometers by 80 kilometers by 35 kilometers deep. Okay. <coughs> and uh, what's interesting, of course, is that they've run this both on Cori 2 okay, and on the new Sierra system. And the parameters are exactly the same. Okay. Uh, and the runtime is exactly the same. What's interesting is that they are using 85% of Cori, Cori 2, which is a half million cores, uh, compared to just using 256 nodes on Sierra. So only 6% 6 of Sierra was used to give you the same results that took 85% of Cori, 8,000 nodes. So we're seeing really dramatic advances in the science that we can do by adding that GPU acceleration in there. And that's about my time, and that's about where I'll stop. So, I'll stop here.